So he's going to be uh, a speaker, uh, next keynote address. So he's uh, somebody I've known for over 10 years now. He was the primary reason why I ended up going to UT Dallas. He basically took me into a room in his office, talked to me for 20 minutes, and I transferred from Northeastern to, to, to UT Dallas. So, so he is also the co-founder and head of the uh, Center of AI and ML uh, Center at UT Dallas as well. And he's joining us, I think, from France, oh, or maybe India. He's been flying. <laughs> Every time I talk to him, he's in a different place. But yeah, so he's, he's going to be a great, uh, 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 great speaker talking about automating common sense reasoning. And uh, some of his great uh, funding sources are DARPA, EPA, and, and NSA as well. So uh, I think he has something with NASA too. So, so yes, so welcome, Dr. Gupta. I know it's very late for you, Dr. Gupta, but welcome. The stage is all sure. yours. Thank, thank, thank you so much. OK, so let's get started then. So thank, thank you for inviting me to give a talk. I've been listening to the opening speech by Dr. Nguyen, and yeah, very interesting. So I'm going to be so. So Dr. Gwynn talked about um, human knowledge. So I'm going to be talking about how to automate, essentially automate human knowledge or the human thought process or how to automate common sense reasoning. Uh, so let's get started. So of course, you know, this work is has been jointly done with uh, maybe about a, a dozen students and a number of postdocs over the last 10, 12 years. Um, so even though my name is there, it really is a collective talk from my lab. So let's you know look at AI. Uh, machine learning has taken the center stage uh, in the last few years, as we all know, right? That it's all the rage, and it's really a great technology that has revived AI. Um, you know, there were AI winters and stuff, but you know now people talk. Everyone talks about AI from you know maybe even high school kids, young kids to all the way uh, you know the oldest person you could meet. Everybody's excited about AI, but when people say AI, they mean machine learning. But you know there is. But AI has many forms, right? AI, it's not just machine learning, but, you know, there's also things like reasoning. So my talk is going to be focused more on, on reasoning. So there's increasing realization that machine learning alone cannot lead to advanced general intelligence or AGI, where my presumption is that achieving AGI or human-like intelligence is essentially the holy grail of AI. Now, of course, you know, when we want to achieve human-like intelligence, we um, want to make sure that, you know, we, as humans, we make mistakes, you know, for example, we misremember things or we are tired, but of course we want an AGI system to not make such mistakes. So what we also need to achieve AGI is not just machine learning, but also automated reasoning because AI essentially has two main components, learning or intelligent behavior has two main components, learning and reasoning. And my talk is going to be about automating this reasoning aspects. So humans use both learning and reasoning, right? We use our uh, our senses to essentially acquire knowledge of the world and sort of build a model of the world around us. And then we use, and, and this knowledge will reside in our brain, and then we'll use reasoning to, um, to draw further conclusions. Now, why is reasoning, it's important to automate reasoning. So, you know, there's people argue, there's argument that, um, Machine learning, learning alone can is essentially achieve AGI or advanced intelligence. But I don't believe that's possible. And as an argument, I give you the following argument. If it was possible for uh, an intelligent, for, for AGI to be achieved using pattern matching, then nature would have created an intelligent being that solely relies on pattern matching, which is essentially the equivalent of, of machine learning or instinctive behavior. So... If there was an intelligent being that could be created based on pattern matching alone, then nature would have created it already. Now, if you if you look at nature, then um, th there are animals that have better uh, better uh, smell than us. I mean, dogs, for example, can smell better, or there are animals that can that have better eyesight. There are animals that have better touch. So nature is able to uh, essentially produce sensing technology, quote unquote that is better than what is found in humans. However, the most intelligent being is us humans. And nature had to resort to reasoning to, to achieve that kind of intelligence. And if you look at the evolutionary chain, uh, then as we move up the evolutionary chain, we see you know, better and better reasoning capabilities. So 
for intelligent behavior, we really need both learning and reasoning. So what distinguishes us really from lower life forms, quote unquote lower again, is our common sense reasoning capabilities, right? And this reasoning ability allows us to sort of sit at the top of the evolutionary chain. So reasoning capability is very important for an AI system. And I strongly believe that AGI cannot be achieved by machine learning alone. So the question is, how do we automate common sense reasoning? So what is the key to human sophistication in intelligent behavior? So human intelligence has two main components. We already you know, I talked about that learning or you know, essentially it's pattern recognition. We use our senses to gain knowledge about the world that surrounds us. The sensory input is turned into knowledge that that is stored in our brain or predicates. We can think of them as predicates that reside in our brain. Right. So, for example, you know, if the smell is foul, you, you know, your brain will record that, you know, there's foul smell around here. Then we see patterns, you know, in this, uh, in our observations through our senses that we turn into rules and essentially we make inductive generalizations. So it's sort of like learning or machine learning. And we may create rules, for example, if it smells strange, you know, if a food item smells strange, then don't eat it. We, we can also learn through, you know, someone teaching us, for instance. So not only, not only we learn or learn rules by through inductive generalization, but someone else can teach us these rules as well. The other component is reasoning, where we make inductive generalizations based on our observations. And these inductive generalizations are turned into rules or, you know, these are basically for of uh, default rules that I'll describe a little bit later. And then once these rules reside in our mind, we exercise these rules on the knowledge that we have to draw new conclusions. And we may actually further refine these rules as we go along. So for example, we might have a rule that sits in our mind that if something smells strange, don't eat it. But then we know that fermented foods are um, can smell strange, but yet they can be eaten. So you might actually have an exception to this default that if something smells strange, that then by default, you don't want to eat it unless it's some kind of per fermented food that you know. So humans use both learning and reasoning in a very sophisticated manner. We uh, use inductive generalizations that we turn into rules. But then once we have these rules, we may also sort of turn them into you know, like a lookup table and use pattern matching to find an answer. So for example, we may we may have a rule in our mind, but we may apply it mindlessly. So there is a sort of a grave area between reasoning and and matching or instinctive behavior. So if you want to realize advanced general intelligence, we really need to emulate the way humans uh, learn and reason. We cannot rely on machine learning alone. Machine learning is systems are essentially universal function approximators, as we know, and they would really only learn an approximation. And I'm sure you've seen all these stories of how you know, machine learning system made an egregious error. And also for our survival and well-being, we really need precision. I mean, we cannot just rely on something that may be wrong some of the times, right? So reasoning is very important. So consider autonomous driving, for example. For example, for us humans, learning to steer and brake and accelerate is the hard part. So go back to, you know, think about when you were learning driving. What was the hard part? The hard part was learning to control the steering, you know, when to apply the brakes, when to accelerate and sort of controlling the car. But knowing that we should brake for pedestrians or we should stop at a red light, that was the easy part. I mean, that came instinctively. For autonomous vehicles, though, it's the opposite. Steering, braking and acceleration is, uh, is, is the easy part, is easy because that's mechanically programmed. But predicting what actions to take is tough. Knowing that you know you have to stop is the hard part. So my conjecture is, and there's a lot of discussion about, about autonomous vehicles, you know, with the popularity of Tesla, that at a, auton, autonomous vehicles that rely solely on machine learning will never reach the highest level, which is the SAE level five. To build SAE level five AVs, we need to emulate how humans drive. We use our sight, you know, our, and our you know hearing capabilities, seeing and hearing capabilities to understand the scene. And the scene, the knowledge about the scene is so stored as predicates in our mind, sort of, you know, we have this knowledge in our mind. Then we use our reasoning capabilities to make a decision about steering or braking or accelerating or whatever else we have to do. So if you want to build an AV system, we, for understanding the scene and converting to knowledge, we need to use machine learning. For actually making the driving decision based on this knowledge, we need, we need to use automated common sense reasoning. So what is common sense reasoning? So reasoning typically has relied on logic and, you know, classical logic that has been studied for thousands of years and, you know, modern logic in the last 100 plus years has been used for automating reasoning. But classical logic, 
has failed at performing human style common sense reasoning and in fact most formalisms have failed and the problem is that classical logic is monotonic whereas common sense reasoning requires non monotonicity what does non monotonicity means it means that the system should be able to revise its earlier conclusion in light of new information so as we discover new information new knowledge we should be able to revise our de decision so for example so essentially we work as humans we work with the knowledge we have but then as we learn more we revise our conclusions so for example we know that again you've probably seen it in your ai textbooks if tweet is a bird we can that Tweety can fly. However, if we come to know that Tweety is a penguin later, then we will retract this con this conclusion that Tweety can fly. Right. So, so that essentially what it says that knowledge is non-monotonic. You know, it keeps the the, the number of the, the set of derivable derivable facts keeps changing over time. We can also draw a conclusion from absence of information. So for example, let's say it's drizzling outside and we can't tell if it's really raining or not. We'll look out and see if anyone is holding an umbrella. If no one is holding an umbrella, then we conclude it must be raining. But again, remember that our knowledge is incomplete really. Those people out who are out there, you know, we may just want to get wet, for example. Then we also work with, you know, what we call global constraints. So we do not pursue any reasoning that violates a constraint, an integrity constraint, essentially. And then we also have some invariants in our mind that must hold. So, for example, we know that it's impossible to walk and sit at the same time. And so if we see that somebody's walking, we know that they're not sitting. I mean, these kind of implicit inferences happen in our mind all the time, almost automatically. We also know, for instance, that instance that a human must breathe to stay alive, right? So if we see a human and we know and is alive, we know that the person must be breathing. And the most important of all is that we perform assumption-based reasoning. So we we actually run non-inductive semantics in our head. So a good example is so suppose I asked you, do uh, can fish talk like humans? So obviously you're going to say, no, of course, fish cannot talk like humans. But there is a there is children's uh, world of cartoons or, you know, uh, world of children's books where fish do talk, right? So fish can talk in the cartoon world, but not in the real world. So there are two possible worlds really that we are we have in our mind. One is the cartoon world and one is the real world. Things can happen in the cartoon world that cannot happen in the real world and vice versa. So we really hold multiple worlds in our mind. So, you know, if you look at mathematics and logic, it has focused on inductive semantics, which means only one model, only one world, but the real world is not like that. And so if we ask someone, does Nemo the fish talk? Then if Nemo the fish is you know it's the movie then we know that nemo can talk but if it if it's nemo the fish in your fish tank then obviously you cannot talk as humans we can perform all that reasoning and it actually relates to assumption based reasoning so we can actually realize uh, common sense automate common sense reasoning by using this one concept called negation as failure that i'm going to explain next and this cyclical reasoning so this assumption based reasoning or multiple reasoning with multiple worlds is actually cyclical reasoning so let's look at classical negation versus negation as failure and i'm I'm sure all of you are familiar with logic you, you know what negation is so classical negation will represent it as minus p and so if we state minus sibling john comma jim as a predicate then what we're saying is that we know for for sure that john and jim are not siblings there is a proof we have a proof that john and jim are not siblings so for classically negated predicates we need an explicit proof of falsehood so for example if you want to prove that you know, prove minus Rob Sutton Bank One, where Sutton is the famous Billy Sutton, who gave the famous answer when asked, you know, why do you rob banks? He said, well, because that's where the money is. So if you want to show that Sutton did not rob Bank One, then we need an explicit proof, for example, that he was in, in New York while the bank was in LA and so on. In contrast, negation is failure is, will be presented as not P, and suppose we have not sibling John comma Jim as opposed to minus sibling John comma Jim, then this this statement here says that there is no evidence that John and Jim are siblings. And since there is no evidence that John and Jim are siblings, I fail to prove that John and Jim are siblings. We will assume that not sibling John comma Jim holds true. So negation as failure is used by humans all the time, right? We try to prove something. If we fail, we assume that it does not hold. So we assume that sibling John comma Jim is false. So we try to prove a proposition P. If we fail, we conclude that not P is true. Or no evidence of P, then conclude not P is true. And now, if we had 
this goal not drop certain comma bank one <coughs> then we'll try to prove that certain drop bank one if we fail to prove then we have to assume that he did not drop the bank so you see the difference fail to prove which is we fail to prove something that's negation as failure versus explicitly proving falsehood classical negation so so our approach to automating common sense reasoning is going to be based on logic programming or prologue a language that you may be familiar with once we incorporate negation as failure in prologue, we can model common sense reasoning. And in fact, there's a particular semantics of negation as failure, but I cannot get into technical details called stable model semantics. And prologue plus, plus negation as failure is actually called answer set programming, a technology that has been researched in the last 30 plus years. So consider the college admission process. So let's design some commonsensical things or common automate some commonsensical processes. So for example, college admission that all of you are familiar with. So we're trying to determine if someone is eligible for college admission. So obviously, if somebody's high GPA, then they are eligible. So read this is X is eligible if colon dash is if X has a high GB, GPA. But we always have to consider situations. So for example, the person may have a high GPA, but may have a, 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 a felony record and therefore maybe you know, that abnormal situation may apply with respect to eligibility. So we always have this uh, abnormal case covered. And then we can also admit students who have a special talent like an athlete or, but they must have a fair GP. And again, you know, you can have an abnormal situation. But then we also have people who are not special and who do not. So minus special X, we are able to definitely prove that X is not special. We're definitely able to be prove that X does not have a high GPA, then we conclude that X is not eligible. But there will be students for whom we are unable to prove that they are eligible and we are unable to prove that they are ineligible. For those students, we can create a rule saying they must be interviewed. So you see the use of negation as failure. I fail to prove that X is eligible. I fail to prove X is ineligible. Then I must interview that individual. And so if John has a fair GPA, not, which is not high, then this program will conclude that <coughs> John must be interviewed. So automation of common sense reasoning, that's again, you know, people have been working on it for a long, long time. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, you've heard of the site project and many other things. However, there have been recent advances, especially in the field of answer set programming, that gives us a lot of ho hope. So just to quickly summarize, how do we humans reason? We use default rules. So again, normally a bird flies unless it's a penguin. So another same example repeated again. <coughs> Excuse me. So we write X flies if X is a bird unless it's an abnormal bird. And who are abnormal birds? They are penguins. We also use integrity constraints that are planted in our brain. So a bird cannot fly and perch at the same time. So we'll write uh, X flies and Conjunction of X flies and X perch, X can perch is false. And finally, the, 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 the multiple words that we can hold in our mind. So we say X, if X is a bird, then X can talk, but the cartoon world condition must hold. So if X is a bird and it's the cartoon world, then X can talk. And we are in the cartoon world if we are not in the real world and we're in the real world if we're not in the cartoon world. So we're really saying that the two worlds are mutually exclusive. So um, that's what that's what you see, you know, kind of a cyclical rule, right? This there's a cycle here. But as humans, we're able to manage all this. So ASP supports all these three types of features. And there are goal directed implementations of answer set programming, you know, particularly from our lab which is also a big step that allows us to automate common sense reasoning. So now before I go into showing you some examples, I wanted to also tell you that once you understand how you can automate common sense reasoning, that also gives you the basis for explainable AI. So let's explore that for a few minutes. Um, so how, so, so let's talk about, you know, us humans learning. So we observe, we generalize, then we may find some exceptions, then we may find exceptions to exceptions and so on. And so we're constantly refining, you know, creating rules or inductive generalizations 
based on what we observe. And so we're constantly adjusting the decision boundary, very much like you know what a neural network might do. So again, let me give you an example. So we observe that many birds fly. So we have a bunch of birds. You know, we saw maybe you know there are what thirteen birds here. Points each point represents a bird, a particular bird. We saw you know it was a bird, and we saw it could fly. We concluded that birds fly, and we came up with a rule in our head saying, oh, all birds fly. If X is a bird, X flies. But then we discovered penguins that are birds that don't fly. So we get our first decision boundary. We see these red dots that are penguins that do not fly. And so we separate the two. And how do we model that? We say, aha, there are abnormal birds. And these abnormal birds are penguins. So these are the exceptions. So these are my default, you know, we call them as default, you know, and we call, call these as exceptions. But then let's say hypothetically, hypothetically, there is a, a subgroup of penguins called super penguins that can fly. So we have an exception to an exception. So aha, but super penguins do fly. And so I can refine. So again, I define my decision boundary. So this green dot represents. So the green dot was classified as a penguin, but I must revise my boundary and push this to the fly side. And how do I model that? I model that as. If X is a bird, X flies, unless it's an abnormal bird. An abnormal bird is a penguin, but I could have abnormal penguins, and abnormal penguins are super penguins that can fly. So you see how you can constantly adjust your decision boundary by learning the default, the exception, exception to exceptions, exception to exceptions, and so on. And we actually turned it into a machine learning algorithm that works very well called Fold SE. So here is an example, and it actually provides what, what we call scalable explainability. No matter how big the data set, it will give you a very small number of rules and still give you high accuracy and precision and recall and F1 score, etc. So here is the famous adult da income data set example. And our algorithm that I just described in the previous slide will give you two rules. So now these two rules are, is the model with an accuracy of 0.85%, which is equivalent to, you know, what XGBoost or your neural network or multi-layer, or essentially, you know, multi-layer perceptrons may find. And it only does that in 1.5 seconds. And here is the famous Titanic survival data set. So here it's able to explain who will survive on the Titanic. This, this is from Kaggle with an accuracy of 99%, just with two rules and in fraction of a second so here are some you know so again this tool is actually the predecessor of the tool which is still pretty good is available for free on github try it out so here's comparison of this tool with xg boost and multi-layer perceptrons or neural networks essentially so you can see let's take an example so here for example you can see that the accuracy of xg boost on this autism problem is point sorry, Parkinson's problem is 0.76. MLPs give 0.6. We're able to produce 0.82. So accuracies are kind of comparable. If we use this, you know, this default rule way of computing a model, um, sometimes, you know, one tool wins, sometimes the other and so on. But what is incredible is the runtime. So you see, for example, rain in Australia, 385 seconds for XG boost, 243 seconds for MLP, and only 10 seconds for our algorithm based on um, learning default rules. And in fact, in some situations, some situations, the uh, 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 system is, other systems are not able to compute uh, a model, primarily because they run out of memory. And whereas, you know, here you can, we can run produce it in 3.5 seconds and the number of rules produced is very small so this is comparing it with other rule based induction algorithms ripper and, and you can see that rain in australia which has 145000 records it's able to explain in just 2.5 i mean this is over average over 10 runs three rules basically so which is quite incredible so you see the power of if you understand how common sense is automated which is essentially how human humans work, then that also gives us the basis for explainable AI and really fast machine learning systems. So now I'll just give an example of 
think I have maybe another five minutes. So, so I'll give you an example where we of where we try to automate something very commonsensical. So I pick up this example from you know Hector Levesque, who many of you may know, his most recent book. So he makes gives these statements: George is a bachelor. George was born in Boston and collects stamps. A son of someone is a child who is male. George is the only son of Mary and Fred. A, who, a man who is a man marries an adult male person who is a bachelor. A bachelor is a man who has never been married. What's a marriage? Marriage is a contract between a man and a woman enacted by a wedding and dissolved by a divorce. And while the contract is in effect, the man is called the husband and the woman is called the wife are said to be married. So that's the definition of being married. And then what is a wedding? A wedding is a ceremony where you have bride, groom, bouquet, etc. And now what he wants you to answer are the following questions. George has never been a groom at a wedding. So you see, as a human, you know, it's very easy for us to conclude. <coughs> the question is, how do we compute them automatically? George. So you can see that George is a bachelor. Um, and, you know, we have a definition of a groom. Um, and so we, right, using our common sense reasoning, we can very quickly tell that, yes, indeed, that's the case that George has never been the groom at a wedding. And then he wants you to show that Mary has an unmarried son born in Boston. And you may ask, okay, who's that person? So we can clearly see that George um, is the only son of Mary and Fred. So it's the son of Mary. George is a bachelor and is unmarried, therefore... And he's born in Boston. So the answer is George. <coughs> but you see how this imp information is implicit. And then we have to show that no woman is the wife of any of Fred's children. So we can see that um, George is George is the only son of Mary and Fred. So this statement is also true. And since George is a bachelor, He's not married, so therefore does, there does not exist a woman who's the wife of George. So how do we how do we turn this knowledge into an executable form, and how we turn these questions into queries so we can execute them? And that's what ASP allows us to do. So here are here's the coding and coding. George is a bachelor, so again that's a fact. So these are all predicates. Again, birth city, hobby. X is the son of Y if X is child of Y and X is male. And it's also cyclical sort of. It, it, it doesn't matter. You can say and who's X is child of Y if X is son of Y. X is a male if X is a son. George is child of Mary. George is child of Fred. George is male. And now we will tell that George is the only son through a constraint, integrity constraint by saying if X is the son of Fred, and X and Fred has another son called another son, then another son must not equal X should be false. And likewise for Mary, and then we can define who's a man, who's a bachelor, and now we use negation as failure. X is a bachelor, if X is a man, and no evidence that X is married to some Y at some time T. Definition of married, married is time dependent. X is married to Y at time T, if X is a groom, Y is a bride. And they got wedded at time T1, where time T of marriage, of being married, which could be the present moment, is greater than T1. And they are not divorced and so on. And so on. So, um, and then definition of a groom. Groom is someone who is wedded as male and so on. And, and then, of course, we have to say wedding precedes divorce. right? So we have to put this constraint as well. With this knowledge... We can actually pose queries like groom George, negation of groom George. And this is our, you can run all this in our system. It will give you answers. And then you can define, for example, uh, the concept of unmarried son born in Boston. So where M is the person, X actually should be any city. X is the, M is the mother or, um, or sort of represents Mary. X is the son and C is the city. So we say X is the son of M, X is birth city C, and X is, there is no Y and no time T at which X got married to Y at time T. And then you can run UMSBB, Mary, comma, X, comma, Boston. It will tell you X equals George. I, I'm, I mean, I would have run the code if I had time, but, you know, I don't. And then likewise, you can code no woman is the wife of 
Fred's children and so on. Okay, so, so you see you can take this kind of mundane information and actually represent it as knowledge and then you can query it. Okay, so, to, so coming to my conclusions, so automating common sense reasoning is holy grail of AI. And so my argument is that AGI is not achievable by human, by machine learning alone. Else nature would have already found an, an, a being, an organism that is super intelligent, but only uses pattern matching or machine learning or just uses its senses. And that's not the case. We need a combination of machine learning and common sense reasoning. You know, just like humans use both. And for automating common sense reasoning, we need three constructs, reasoning with defaults and exceptions, global constraints and multiple possible worlds. These constructs can be represented in answer set programming and executed with our SCASP engine. So there are many people actually using our engine, for example, for automating legal reasoning, um, for uh, automating uh, treatment, figuring out, you know, treatment for diabetes, treatment for heart failure and so on, where you automate the guidelines used by physicians. So judicious combination of learning and reasoning can result in novel applications. So there are many of these that we are pursuing in our lab. So for example, we're trying to build an autonomous vehicle system where we use machine learning for processing the scene. And then once that knowledge has been acquired, we use common sense reasoning to figure out, you know, what action to take, driving action to take. We're also working on building chatbots. So everyone is after building automated chatbots. But anytime you go on the web and you interact with a chatbot, very quickly you get disappointed and give up because they're all based on pattern matching machine learning. But to build a real chatbot, you need to understand what is being said. You need to have an understanding. So how do you get the understanding? So you take the sentence, English sentence. So think about when we hear an English sentence, we don't actually, I mean, we may parse it, but we don't actually parse it. We translate that into knowledge in our head. So what we're trying to do is use machine learning for converting an English sentence into knowledge or predicates. Once I have these predicates, then augmented with common sense knowledge, which is also expressed in ASP, answer set programming, I will actually compute the response. So we're trying to build, you know, very narrow chatbots like concierge or, you know, help desk at a, say, a university, uh, you know, uh, department, university department or something like that. So, but the idea is that the chatbot should be able to understand what is being said by the user and not just guess by using machine learning. And then also things like automated emergency response management, where you sort of see the scene, right? Use machine learning technology to build the model of the world represented as predicates and then use common sense knowledge to take action and also things like automated software assurance. So a whole bunch of projects going on in my lab, you know, funded, some funded by, you know, various entities. Uh, so DARPA is funding the work on automated software assurance. Um, and so, so the goal is to use, essentially simulate, emulate a human in order to build these intelligent systems. And I strongly believe that until we do that, we really cannot achieve AGI. And at this point, I'll stop, hopefully within time, and I can take questions. Uh, common oh, sense reasoning and explainable AI. Maybe we have uh, time for, for, for a question. Yeah. It, it seems like we've had this conversation before. In the late 60s, we had people saying, neural networks are not sufficient. We need common sense reasoning. In the 80s, we right. said, common sense reasoning in the form of expert systems is not sufficient. We need neural networks. And then, you know, we, we had these grand arguments in the 90s about whether or not syntax or learned systems were good for AI natural language understanding. And here we have, again, in the presence of a dominant neural paradigm, somebody arguing that prologue is a good thing. It seems to me that the experience I've had both academic and industrial, is that the people who had to get things done always did both. People always did feature engineering, AKA rules, with some sort of learned system that was then constrained by what is called an industry business logic. What's the distinction? And, and people who were doctrinaire, things like the Psych Project, went on and on and on and failed. Right. So. What do you see is the difference you? here with what you're saying versus these conversations we've had again and again? So yeah, so excellent question. So the difference is that now we actually have much better understanding of how you know the 
the human thought process works let's say so for example non inductive semantics so the the logic and mathematics world has been uh, um, adamant on using only inductive semantics and inductive semantics only admit a single world so the real advancement is this answer set programming and then it's goal directed implementation that allows us to you could say build much better expert systems that closely emulate the human thought process so that's really the advancement now if you look at systems like psych it has something like 1200 inference mechanisms or procedures right something like that and the question is how do we even decide which mechanism to use so one of the things is that the the inference mechanisms that we use for automating common sense reasoning have to be very simple otherwise you know we we would not be able to reach the conclusion we want to reach because we don't even know you know what reasoning technique to apply and so that's that's basically the 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 reason you know we believe or i believe that we actually have gotten there now because of advancements in you know this non inductive semantics working with multiple worlds you know being able to reason uh, at at the predicate level uh, you could have multiple worlds if you use propositional logic for instance for instance because you have you can you can get multiple models for a formula and you can work with them but then um that's not sufficient because you know we don't reason at the propositional level we actually reason at the predicate level so so now there are extensions where we can we know how to make predicate logic work under non inductive semantics so something called co induction which is a dual of induction so these are some of the advances that gives us hope and you know we build systems that that can actually emulate the human thought process really well uh for example treat congestive heart failure at the level of expertise of a cardiologist and and so so at least you know again un, until we build these things uh, we'll never know but at least you know we these advancements you know i feel uh are the reasons why you know we should have more hope yes but this argument has been going on absolutely i agree with you but this time it's different just as a joke yes so so yes th- th- there are advancements to underpin you know this this optimism and my argument is that we really need both and if we want to emulate human intelligence we need both learning and all right great thanks dr emul- gupta once again where we should emulate human reasoning itself right there's just a little bit of lag on our end here so a bit of interruptions sure. but but yeah so thank you once again dr gupta for staying up late and and doing the talk for us So thank you